What I'd like you to do is just to bow your heads with me as we open this worship hour in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we do long for the time where we will not see through a glass darkly, but when we will actually see you face to face. And we think of what happened to Moses when you used to speak to him face to face. How that his face just lit up, that in actual fact he had to veil it. Is It is our sincere desire, gracious Father, that as we spend this time with you, our faces will also light up. And that people will become conscious of the fact that we have just been in the throne room of the King of Kings um, presence. Thank you again that we can ask you to help us to worship you correctly. Dear Jesus, thank you for introducing us to your Father and allowing us to call him our Father. Holy Spirit, it is our desire that we won't only know the Father, but that we will be like him, that we will love as he loves. So be with us now, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like you to turn with me to Luke chapter 12. I want you to go to Luke chapter 12, and I'm going to be reading from verse 54 on. Luke chapter 12, from verse 54. He said to the crowd, When you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say, It is going to rain, and it does. And when the south wind blows, you say, It is going to be hot, and it is. Hypocrites! You know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky. How is it that you don't know how to interpret this present time? Dear friends, it's so interesting that um, our theme or our heading for today is how close are we to the end? That is our subject. So as we prepare to look at this together, may the Spirit of God guide us. So what I'd like you to do with me, as we see there, I want you to go to our opening scripture, which was found in Luke chapter 12, and we're going to see there from verse 54 again. When you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say it is going to rain. And it does. And when the south wind blows, you say, it is going to be hot. And it is. Then these amazing words, hypocrites. You know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky. How is it that you don't know how to interpret this present time? Now, what I'm hoping to do is to try and remove from us that title of hypocrites and you know a hypocrite is a person who claims to do something or to to say something that they're doing but their actions are totally opposite to their words and are we a people who are truly adventist we talk about being seventh day we talk about being Sabbath keepers, but are we truly Adventists? You see, the title Adventist is a person who recognizes the, the events that show the coming of Christ in the clouds of heaven. And it is our duty as God's people to prepare the way for his coming and yet we ask the question the world is asking is it really the time of the end and so dear friends i want you to understand that my attempt today is not to go to the prophetic words such as luke 21 matthew 24 or mark I'm 13. No, it's not my intent 
to try and go and find out what are the signs of the times. No. It is my purpose to use a timeline given to us to show you truthfully how close we are to the end of time. And in order to do this, I'd like you to go with me and I'm going to use Revelation chapter 6 as the chapter to take you along this journey. Revelation chapter 6. So please go with me to, the, to that scripture. Now, in order for me to be able to get you started on this journey, we need a starting point. So imagine if I had a whiteboard now and I would go to my whiteboard and I would draw a line. And that would be a timeline. And somewhere on this timeline, I need to have a date that is going to be a starting date. What will be the starting date for me to determine where we are in time? How close are we to the end? If I at the end of my timeline put second coming or put the end of this world as we know it, as it says there in Revelation chapter 21, that the first order of things has passed away. That the world as we know it now will become obsolete, will become redundant, will no longer be there because there will be a new heaven and a new earth. That point in time, at the end of time, when this world will no longer be our home and for a thousand years we'll be taken away from this world and we'll be, we'll be found in the new Jerusalem. That point how far away are we from that point? So in order to know this, we need to start the timeline somewhere. And so I've asked you to be with me there in Revelation chapter 6. But I want you just to jump back for a moment because we need a starting point, And I want you to go to Revelation chapter 5, the, the chapter before. And I want you to notice there that a question is asked in verse 2. Listen to the question. Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? So we see that in order for us to understand the timeline, and we know that seals in this prophetic word here found that we are going to be studying are dispensations of time. That's what the seals are. They are periods of time. Okay. And I want you to notice there, the question is asked, who can open up the seals? Who can reveal them to us? And we find there that it says there in verse 4, I wept and wept because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or look inside. You see, we can't look inside what's going on in the scroll until it is opened. And who is worthy? And John weeps. It says there he wept and wept. But then there's these encouraging words, ver, words in verse 5. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See. The line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. So here we find that Christ is the one that can help us to have a starting point. A point where we can see where we are in time. And the interesting thing is, as John turns... It says there in verse 6, Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. Now what I want you to understand here is that we are introduced to a scene here Right at the beginning of the opening of the seals, the opening of the timelines, the opening of the dispensations of time, we are introduced to its beginning. 
and the beginning is described there in the lamb that as it says there um, looking as if it had been slain so what are we what is the starting point is the starting point there in genesis no is the starting point there at the flood no is the starting point um in the city of bethlehem when jesus was born no is the starting point then when jesus is hanging on the cross of calvary not quite when is the starting point it says the slain lamb that means it is after christ's crucifixion that we find christ standing in the presence of the father now do you remember that when mary was trying to hold on to jesus jesus said that this was after his resurrection don't hold on to me because i still have to ascend to the father now we find here that christ here is portrayed as being in the presence of the ancient one the one who sits on the throne and we find here something interesting which um, I don't know if you noticed, it doesn't say that the Lamb was standing in the presence of the Father. It doesn't say that the Lamb was standing a certain distance away from the Father. Listen to the words there in Matthew chapter 5. It says, uh, sorry, Revelation chapter 5. It says very clearly, Then I saw a Lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne. <laughs> not standing in the on the platform down below no this lamb is found actually on the throne standing in the center of the throne quite amazingly so we find that jesus christ is back in the presence of the father in actual fact christ jesus christ has taken his position as it was before in in the presence of the godhead the godhead is now united we have the father we have the son and we have the holy spirit back as one but the role of christ is still the role of intercessor is still the role of mediator you see even though he was god and even though he is god his role is still that of seeking and saving the lost and he wants us to be conscious and aware of time. He wants us to know where we are. You know, people often ask me, Willie, how close are we to the end of time? It is my objective to show you how close we are. But before I do that, I almost want to give an answer that Ellen White, once when she was asked, you know, when will Jesus come? Do we have a particular day or year? Ellen White actually commented, what, what, is, what is that answer going to give you? If I tell you in 50 years, are you now going to follow him? Or are you going to live a reckless life? And then maybe, hopefully, when the time comes closer, you will surrender to him. You see, dear friends, sometimes when we ask this question, is it because we still want to live a life of sin and we're asking how close is it to the end so that we can know that we need to change? Or, or do you think we should really be changing even though there might be still another thousand years? You see, I want you to understand that the objective of why I'm giving you this presentation is not to give you license to continue to, to, be, um, to live a life of sin or to live a life that is um, surrendered over to, to sin, to Lucifer. No, I'm not encouraging you to do that at all. And I'm hoping that by the end of my presentation, you will feel cautious about that. You see, Jesus tells us about a man who was a very uh, successful man in business. And he is a farmer and he has this incredible harvest. And as a result of this incredible harvest, he thinks to himself, I need to build bigger barns. You know, I need to fill up that, you know, those barns because I've got a lot of time. And Jesus says to him, you foolish man, you thought that you still had a lot of time. You still thought that you could still wait until a certain ringing of the bell and then you were ready. No, you foolish man. You don't know that in tonight, in this hour, your life would be expected of you. There would be a, a, um, 
a, a what's the right word there there will be this accountability for why you lived the life you lived you know I can't help but think of Belshazzar the young king even though he had all the knowledge of what his father his grandfather great grandfather did Nebuchadnezzar even though he heard of all of that this young man was reckless with the time that he had and instead of taking the time seriously he was feasting and he was actually a mocking God you know um, taking the things of God and abusing those things and little did he realize that he had been weighed in the balance and that he had been found wanting you see that very night Babylon fell and dear friends I want you to understand we need to be very cautious when we think that we still have a lot of time because the word counsels me he that thinketh he stand take heed lest he fall you see I want you to understand that the purpose of what I'm doing here is not to allow you to become complacent in your life but to actually draw your attention to this that if there was an end time or a people who are living close to the end of time we are that generation and I want to show you this so let's have a look here we find Christ in the presence of God so our starting point on the timeline if we had to put a date on it would be any time after AD 31 okay for the for the scholars 31 CE common era it'll be any time after 31 why because in the middle of the week in the year 31 Christ died on the cross of Calvary so it is a slain lamb that we see here so it is that period of time when Christ finds himself again in the throne room of heaven the interesting thing is we see him and then he does this most amazing thing and I want you to notice what verse 7 says of Revelation chapter 5 verse 7 says he came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. So he came and he took the scroll. Who is worthy? The slain lamb is worthy. And you know, the most amazing thing is if you go to verse 12 of chapter 5, it says, In a loud voice, this is everybody, they sing these words, Worthy is the lamb who was slain. So here we have past tense not to be slain who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise then I heard every creature in heaven and on the earth and under the earth I want you to understand every person that's us also where they um, and on the sea and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And then all the elders fell down and said, Amen. May it be as we have said. So we find that Christ is back in the throne room of heaven. He's back in the presence of the Godhead. And it is after the year 31 CE. Okay? Christ has taken the scroll from the hand of the Father. And we're going to Revelation chapter 6. And in verse 1, we are introduced to these words. I watched as the Lamb, which was slain. That's paraphrased. That's not in there. Open the first of the seven seals. And dear friends, remember that these seven seals are dispensations of time. And as he opens the first seal... Our time period starts with us now immediately finding ourselves after the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. That is the opening and the time period of the beginning of the first seal. Now I'm not going to go into giving you dates, but I am going to show you certain things as we go on. But I want your attention to be drawn to the first four seals, okay? Revelation chapter 6 verse 1, the opening of the first seal. 
Revelation chapter 6 verse 3, the opening of the second seal. Revelation chapter 6 verse 5, the opening of the third seal. Revelation chapter 6 verse 7, when the Lamb opened the fourth seal. So, by the time we get to verse 8, uh, we get the opening of the first seal. So, from verse 1 to verse 8, we have the opening of the first four seals. Now, there are things that happen there which are relevant. I'm going to touch the last one a little bit, but I want you just to notice something. That at the opening of each one, there is a question or a, a announcement made. Now, I need to just clarify this with you because I know that in the King James translation, it doesn't quite present it correctly. And this might seem strange to you. But I want you to look at Revelation chapter 6 and the, the, the acclamation or the exclamation, sorry, that is found in the first four seals is this. Come. And if I had to have inverted commas, it will be, and if I had to write on my whiteboard here, so I've got the first seal, second seal, third seal, fourth seal, the common phrase in those first four seals is the exclamation, come. And I want you to notice, it's not where the angel says to John, come and see. No, that is not what it should be. Because that word come there is similar to the word found, and I want to show you this. So keep your hand in Revelation chapter 6, and I want you to jump with me to Revelation chapter 22. Okay, Revelation chapter 22. Now, Revelation 22, and I want the verse that I want you to look at is verse 12. Verse 12 says, Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. Do you understand that? So our attention is drawn to the second coming of Christ. He says in verse 13, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have right to the tree of life and grow through the grapes of the city. But now I want you to notice what it says there in verse 17. Now listen to this, dear friends. It says in verse 17, and I know this is what he's found there in the King James. It says in verse 17, the spirit and the bride say, and then I want you to tell me what you see there. It says, come. And I want you to notice that it's in inverted commas and it's got an exclamation mark. Come. And then it says further, and let him who hears say, and then again, Come, and we have the word come with the exclamation mark in inverted commas. And whoever is thirsty, let him come. You see, the, the interesting thing is that the appeal of the Spirit and the Bride and all you hear is that they appeal to God, come, Lord Jesus. So if I had to define the first four seals of time, the desire of those people, starting from verse from um, the 31st year um, CE, after the resurrection of Christ and Christ being in heaven and taking the seals and opening the first seal, from that point on, from that point on, listen to this. The interesting thing is that they all looked forward and appealed to the coming of Christ. You see, it's not strange that they do this. I want you to go with me to Acts chapter 1. And I want you to notice something that happens there that is quite incredible. Acts chapter 1. And it's almost as if, you know, when we read in, in, in the Word of God that Paul says that the gospel that they knew had been taken to the whole world, it was almost as if he was saying, because Jesus said, the gospel of this kingdom must be preached to the whole world and then the end will come. And it's almost as if Paul says, we've taken the gospel to the whole world, the end must come. You see, the desire of their hearts was that the end would come. But Paul knew that he couldn't ask for the end to come because there were certain things that still had to take place. And I'm going to be talking about them. So we see in Acts chapter 1, I want you to notice this. As Jesus is ascending to heaven, verse um, 6, 
and I want you sorry verse 8 uh, Jesus uh, Jesus is speaking to them and he's telling them you know because they ask him you know Lord are you um, going to restore the kingdom of Israel listen to the uh, comments he makes in verse 7 it is not for you to know the time or the dates the father has set by his own authority you see this is interesting that the end time is only something that the father knows nobody else not the angels nor even the son it's not even our responsibility to know the time. So my intent is not to try and give you an end time. But I'm going to show you that we are living in the last days. We are living the closest you could ever live as a people to the end of time. We are that generation. I'm going to show you that. But Jesus then turns around in verse 8. He says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. But then I want you to notice this. Verse 9. After he had said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. Then it says, verse 10. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going. When suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee. Verse 11. They said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. You see, dear friends, as the disciples saw Jesus rise up, you know, it was their longing at the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus was glorified. The disciples, Peter, James and John, actually said to Christ, let us build shelters here so that we can dwell here. You see, it's almost as if we, we are almost impatient with time. We want time. We want Jesus to come now. You know, dear friends, it is a, a um, cry that has started since the resurrection of Christ. That for a great period of time, in actual fact, that period of time is a period of time from 31. So if I had the first four and I had to put here, it'll be a 31 CE and my end of time for this first four periods of time, well actually up to the fourth period of time, will actually, sorry, to the beginning of the fourth period of time will be 538. Why 538? And you're going to see. So, we have a period of time and it starts. Where are we when it comes to this time? Are we close to 31 CE? No, dear friends. We are way beyond. We are in 2020 CE. We are 2,000 years later down the, down the line. Nearly 2,000 years later. We are there. Now I'm going to ask you, those who were living in 31 CE and they cried out, come, were they close to the coming or were they far away from it? Dear friends, in the first seal, they were the furthest group of people away. Peter, James and John, Paul and the disciples of that time were the furthest away from the coming of Christ. Then we had the next group of people, the second seal. Then we have the next group of people the third seal that time period and then I just want to draw your attention to the fourth one that's why I said up to 538 um, CE because in 538 CE we have the beginning time period of the 1260 years now the 1260 years is the time period of the fourth seal Okay, so if I had my time here, the first three seals will be 31 to 538. The fourth seal will be 538 to 1798. Okay, why? Because we see there, and I want you to go with me to the opening of the fourth seal. In verse 7 it says, the lamb opened the fourth seal, which means that we were introduced to the seventh I'm sorry, the fourth dispensation of time. Now, dear friends, you know what is so incredible? When this was given to John, this was still in the future. And so they had to accept this by faith. But we who are actually in 2020 can, in retrospect, look back and actually see the seals been opened. 
And we can see that this period of dark ages, this period of 1,260 years, this period when the, the, the word of God was clothed in sackcloth and ashes, this period of time when they mocked Christian, this period of time when Christian was persecuted and killed, this period of time, dear friends, is the period of the 1,260 year period. And I want you to notice how this is introduced to us. When the Lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard a voice of the fourth living creature say, Come! So again, it is the appeal, Lord Jesus, please come. It is the desire of nations, dear friends. It is the desire of nations that Jesus will come. It is the desire of every Christian that Jesus will come. It is the desire of the, the Spirit, and it is the desire of the bride, and it is the desire of all those who hear to say, Come. It should be the word that's on our lips. We should be truly Adventists saying, Come, Lord Jesus. That should be still our desire. That should be still our, our request. But I want you to notice these group of people, they say, come. And then it says, okay, who are these people? I looked and there before me was a pale horse. Now, the word pale here in the Greek is chloros. Now, immediately that should tell you something. You know, when you think of chlorophyll and you, you think, okay, what is chlorophyll come from? It comes from green leaf things. So the word here, pale, is not really white or of color. No, the word pale here is greenish. And usually when meat decays, it takes on a greenish tint. You see, it is the, the color of decay. It is the color that this world, where we find ourselves, is not healthy. It is full of decay. It is greenish in color. And for 1,260 years, this world was closed in this smell of death. Terrible, dear friends. But we know, by God's grace, as it says there in Matthew 24, that God intervenes. And as we read there in, in Revelation chapter 12, God opens up the earth so that swallows up the torrents of the devil, the flood that the devil poured out, and the earth saved the people. You see, God did not allow mankind or his people to be wiped out. And if God had not intervened in 1798, this world would have been wiped out. Mankind or the living righteous would no longer be. But God had a work for them to do. So, we come to the end period of 1798. Then we are introduced to the ninth, the opening of the fifth seal in verse 9. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they maintained. Now the interesting thing is we are now looking back at this period of time that has just gone by. And you know that it, it is guesstimated, dear friends, that there was more than 300 million people, Christians, Christians, sorry, martyrs that w were that shed their blood for Christ during this 1,260 year time period. We don't even know really how many, but it is it is a it's a known point that at least 300 million people were killed in this time period. Terrible, dear friends. No wonder it was never to be a time. Um, again, we will never go through another 1,260 years of total persecution like this. But it doesn't say there's not going to be persecution because in actual fact in this very seal, it says that God says to them, because they cry out, verse 10, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth? You see, we've moved from, come Lord Jesus, to where we are now. And it seems as if we're getting closer to the end because the question was, come Lord Jesus, come Lord Jesus, come Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. How long, Lord Jesus? It's almost like, you know, listen, we've really come to the, the end. Um, men's minds and thoughts are evil all the time. How long still now till you invent your blood? But then Christ actually says to them, listen to this, verse 11. Then each of them were given a white robe. And there's such a lot more I can talk about there. But it says, and they were told to wait a little longer. Now notice here, they had to wait how long? A little longer. You see, which seal are we now in? We've just opened the fifth seal. Now that fifth seal's time period, if I had to put 
a time for it will be 1798 CE. Why will I say that? Because the sixth seal, which I want you to go with me, in verse 12, it says, I watched as he opened the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth, made of goat's hair, the whole moon turned blood red, and the stars in the sky fell to the earth, as late figs dropped from a fig tree, um, which a wind shaken by a strong wind. Dear friends, and the first introduction to this great earthquake, if I had to draw here, because now what we are given, we are actually given heralds. Heralds are given to us. Heralds are the great earthquake. Heralds are the sun turning dark. Heralds are the moon turning in you know, a blood red. Heralds are the stars falling from the sky. All of a sudden, there are literal events that we can look at. When do these events take place? And the interesting thing is that the first one, which is the great earthquake, is one that we know takes place in 1755 CE. So we have 1798 as a, this time period of the people crying out. So from 1755, we actually have an overlap of, in a sense, the fifth seal and the sixth seal. The next thing which I really want to come to is the we have the sun and moon and stars to I so we have the sun and moon um, losing their uh, their color uh, you know as it says there uh, the sun uh, turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair and the whole, whole moon turned blood but then I want you to notice it says and the stars in the sky fell to the earth and there was actually a literal day a, a, a practical tangible event that actually took place just like the earthquake just like the sun moon and stars that I uh, saw sun and moon that went dark we had a dark day it was recorded as dark we have the stars falling from the sky and the date that we have that is in 1833. So if I had to put a date now, notice where we are now. We have moved from 31 CE and we find ourselves now here in 1833. 11 years before which time period? 11 years before 1844, which was the closing time of the 2300 evenings and mornings. Now I'm going to ask you this question. The people who find themselves in the sixth seal, who see the sun, moon, and stars, and they see those events taking place, are how far away are they in comparison to the ones in 31 CE? You see, the ones in 31 CE were the furthest away, but the ones who find themselves in 1844, 1833 on, those are ones who actually find themselves. Remember, this is the opening of the sixth seal. They find themselves the closest to the second coming. But then we have the opening of the seventh seal. Now, before we have the opening of the seventh seal, a question is asked in verse 17. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? You see the interesting thing. At the end of 1844, in that time period, was the expectation of Christ to come in the clouds of heaven. And that's what everybody expected. They expected the coming of Christ. In actual fact, the world almost went into this great advent of time. They looked for the coming. The desire of the nations was about to fulfill. But then we have the great disappointment. Christ does not come. And the question is asked, who can stand? Now, the interesting thing is that although Christ could have come any time from 1844, the interesting thing is that the world wasn't ready for his coming. So we have what we call now probation. And we are living in probation's time period. Now, dear friends, since 1844, it is, um, what, 176 years later from 1844. 176 years later. I'm going to ask you, here in 2020, how close are we to the coming? If there was a generation that will have the privilege of seeing Christ come in the clouds of heaven, truthfully, it has to be this generation, dear friends. You see, 2020, we are the closest to the second coming that any other generation has ever been. 
Should we be lackadaisy? Should we be negligent of time? No, we cannot afford to be. You see, and I want you to go with me to Matthew chapter 24. Right there where Jesus talks about end time events and what is going to happen and what we need to be aware of. Jesus says in Matthew 24, and I want you to go there with me. He says, verse 32. He's just spoken about the second coming prior to that. Verse 32. Now learn the lesson from the fig tree. You see, our scripture was, we are so good at determining if it's going to rain or if the sun's going to shine, etc. But we, we fail to recognize the signs of this time. Learn the lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, notice this, dear friends, you know that summer is near. We have got all these things. We are gone past all this, the, the um, heralds of time. We find ourselves in the end. The closest any generation has ever been to the coming of Christ. The leaves are on the tree, on the fig tree. May we be not that tree that is cursed. Verse 33, even so when you see all these things, dear friends, you know that it is near right at the door. I tell you the truth. This generation will certainly not pass away until all things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away. But my words will never pass away. Did you hear that? We could be that generation that will see Jesus come in in the clouds of heaven. We are the closest ever generation. We are the closest generation ever to the coming of Christ. I would like to use these words, verse 45. Who then is the faithful and wise servant, whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household, to give them food at the proper time. It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Did you hear that, dear friends? We are to be busy with the business of God. Like Jesus said, must I not be about my father's business? I want to notice you, there's a warning, verse 47. I tell you the truth. He will put him in charge. Sorry, not the warning yet. The reward is, I tell you the truth, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But verse 48 says the warning, but suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, listen to this, and says to himself, my master is staying away a long time. And he then begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he is not aware aware of he will be cut he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be a weeping and a gnashing of teeth you see dear friends i want you to understand we who claim to be seventh day adventists will be hypocritical if we do not really believe that we are that generation you see the signs are showing it. And we must not be foolish, dear friends. Let's rather be the wise and faithful servant. God bless you, dear friends. Thank you so much for being with me. Let's just close our eyes and have a prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are that last group of people. And we are grateful that we can be counted amongst those people but yet please let us not be happy with this you've instructed us to be responsible to others that their blood will be on our hands that we are their keepers we are they are our brothers and their blood must not cry out from the ground to us no gracious father please help us to feel the burden to help everybody to know 
that Jesus is coming and that they need to get ready. And the simple readiness is to accept Jesus as their Savior. So be with us. Help us as a church to fulfill our mission. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.